Welcome to today's admin chat. My name is Kamisha Foley, and we're here to talk about what the future of professional networks will look like moving forward. I mean, it's been a heck of a roller coaster for the last 18 months. And, you know, we're going to look at what used to happen when we were all back at our offices and going to conferences and meetings and professional development. And then we're going to talk about what happened and how networking changed. And then we're going to talk about moving forward, what will professional networking look like? And are there some networks that you don't need to be part of any longer? Are there some opportunities for you to look at new and different um, you know, professional networks? Hello everyone, welcome to today's admin chat. My name is Kamisha Foley and I'm here to talk to you today about professional networking. What is going on with professional networking now that things are starting to open back up? What has happened over the last 18 months? What it used to be like? What happened? What it's going to look like now? And are there places and times where you may not need some of the previous professional networking um, opportunities or associations that you or memberships that you have previously belonged to. And it's just something to really contemplate because everyone's working life has changed. And uh, I don't think anyone's immune to that. So let's just get on over to today's presentation. So obviously we're talking about, is it time to reconnect now that we're heading back into the, into the office and back to work and back to events? What did networking look like pre-COVID, right? So pre-COVID, we had birthday parties, we had happy hours, we had holiday functions, we had professional development courses on, online, offsite, we had conferences for the, for, you know, uh, related to our companies. We had conferences that were related to just our profession. And most of these had an in-person component for getting to meet and greet people, including things like onboarding. So if you started at a new company or you were part of the onboarding team when somebody new started your company, there's still that onboarding is a form of networking. And so that pre-COVID um, networking is, is real, right? And that was face-to-face. -face. So not only could you read body language, you had the option of, you know, kind of getting to know people a little bit better than say, maybe online in an online Zoom room, um, rather than having to have a formal icebreaker to kind of get everybody on the Zoom line all together, you would have something that's a little bit more, you know, relaxed and more uh, less, less structured perhaps. So pre-COVID networking involved a lot of, of, of verbal and physical cues um, and also a lot of social functions. So there was a, a a bigger social component to pre-COVID networking than there was during, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the benefit of that was <clears throat> people felt more relaxed in social settings. In professional development and conference settings, there was still um, a more collegial, relaxed atmosphere. You weren't always on guard for your body language. So when you're on Zoom, right, everybody's watching your face and watching the screen, you know it's being recorded, just like today. And that's not a Zoom background. That's actually um, welcome to my screen porch because it's very hot here today. Networking when we're working from home was a whole different experience because we had limitations. We had limitations to how much time we wanted to spend on screen, online. We may have had demands from friends and family um, to help out, whether it was our children who were home from school, you know, being schooled at the house, whether we um, 
we're taking um, care of things for family and friends that required us to be distracted and not, you know, we just didn't have as much time or, or did we have as much time to focus on uh, the networking piece. And I think what we see happening is that people were so tired of Zoom not even Zoom, right? They were tired of Zoom. They, maybe they were tired of, of Teams or uh, just the online presence of having to be in, in front of a screen and a computer longer than your re regular average working day. And it was for the intent of socializing and meeting and getting to know people and understanding what your colleagues were doing and learning new techniques for your career field or learning about new products for your company. And it just may have seemed like that fatigue, not only the physical fatigue of uh, being in front of a screen and sitting in a chair, the, the eye, the body, the emotional fatigue from trying to be on, right? So you're in screen, you're in, da, 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 you don't want to be distracted. And especially if you had a company that was requiring you to be on screen at all times, uh, that it was a company function, of course. But there were some benefits to networking when working from home. So during COVID, what we saw happen was a different kind of networking among colleagues. So the people that you may have not had time to participate in, in, in tune into um, when you were in an office environment, when you had to be present and you had people coming by and interrupting you all day, now you may have had an opportunity to actually set that time aside to do some online networking, whether it was bingo, whether it was you set up a call with girlfriends or friends or families for just a short time to take a break from the work part of it and tune in and connect with the people that refresh you and give you energy and give you good ideas and let you brainstorm. Now, I have found personal from personal experience that I learn best person to person. And there's two reasons for that. One is I love the body energy, right? And I, I through a hearing impairment, it's, although online learning is tremendous because it has subtitles or captions and I can stop and replay something, that in-person body language is so vital for me um, when I am meeting new people and learning about them or learning something new, I really want to have that structure in front of me so that I can connect. I just don't feel that connection when I am online. One of the other things that happen in terms of networking, those professional memberships. Now, some of them, you really got an opportunity to do those conferences, whereas because the travel wasn't there, right? The cost of travel was not involved. Um, so you could do conferences and a one day professional development networking. You could do those meet and greets online without it costing the travel and hotel and lodging and airfare and all of those things that come into play when you are asking for professional development dollars or, you know, and and have that opportunity to replay those. Most, most associations have found that those professional memberships, although membership numbers went down, participation in conferences and in online uh, seminars and, and, uh, and summits increased because people had the flexibility to attend where they may not have had that flexibility before. Think about it going from one side of the United States to the other. In terms of flying and travel, you have to add a day to go to the West Coast, like from the East Coast to the West Coast for a conference. Well, if you're on Zoom, it just means that you have to get up extra early and and your online video and you have to get up extra early and get coffee and get going before you know the east coast is on ready to go at nine and you're already at lunchtime by the time they crank things up on the west coast right so timing was an issue 
But the most important factor that I wanted to mention here, let me just move this out of the all way, is looking at those professional networks that you have belonged to. Committees at work that you may have been part of, volunteer commitments that you were involved with, whether it was at work or outside the home. You need to determine the value of those networks. I mean, when you think about it, <clears throat> when you think about it, the work networks, you're gonna look at that value. Did it take away time? Did it help you build um, resources? Did it allow you to work towards a, a professional development goal? Did those networks, whether it was, so, so I consider IT, my IT friends, guys, gals, like to be a special network for me in my perception. They are a network of people that I need to um, really cultivate that rapport and network relationship with. They are very important to me because they are the people that I not only can trust to understand what I'm talking about when there's an issue, but they are also the people that tend to give me a heads up when something new is coming down the road, when there's going to be major service changes or a new implementation that's going to impact my team. That particular in-work network is super important to me. Um, and you may have one of your own. And I'm going to look at that value and say, that's a network I want to continue to invest in, invest time and energy in. But maybe there are some that I got away from and I don't need to be part of anymore. It doesn't have the time and, and intrinsic value to me that say having that relationship with my IT team does. For example, if you've ever volunteered for a holiday function, you know exactly what I mean. So yes, it is good um, visual presence. So everybody knows that you're involved in it. You have, um, people outside of your own department and your own team and usually some senior management folks may be aware of your contributions for that event, whether it was like a team event for some sort of um, uh, team building or if it was like for a holiday function, right? And what value did it bring other than giving you visibility? Was it truly a good use of your time? Was it, was there something that, you know, someone that you really wanted to have an opportunity to talk to that that really provided you the only opportunity to get to know them, to, you know, talk some, talk some um, work, but also build a relationship with. If that wasn't the case, then you want to look at the value of that network and see if it was still worth it for you, right? Same goes for outside commitments, volunteer commitments, community organizations. A lot of that didn't happen during COVID because you couldn't, right? Restrictions in terms of gathering numbers, in terms of um, restrictions like those, some of those organizations were shut down. And while they may have some events online, they didn't need the volunteer base that say American Red Cross would need for a blood drive on a normal basis because it had to be restricted and all of those things were in play. So even if, and that goes for like any religious function, you know, for your church or synagogue or, or your mosque. I mean, it doesn't, all of those um, things that you may have invested time in doesn't mean that they're not valuable, but are they valuable to you now? Did you miss it? Did you miss them at all? Like some things, sure, we miss, but probably a majority of them, it wasn't so bad not having that time committed to an organization or to a volunteer commitment. We always joke about a friend of mine whose um, spouse loves to volunteer for everything. And I, I was thinking about this during COVID. I'm like, I wonder what in the world they're doing because that person must have been going crazy not being able to volunteer for you know kids soccer or their um, 
local neighborhood grill cookout, you know, it was like helium hand, you know. So that person really valued their community and volunteer commitments. What will they do now? Will they rebuild that connection? Will they reject it and say, I don't need it anymore? Or will they look at it and decide, I still want part of it, but only a little bit of it. Why are networks important to us anyhow? Only you know the reason why your professional networks are important to you. Think about why those, whether it's a professional membership organization, did your job, did your job or your job duties change during COVID, um, during work from home? Did it change so much that you found that you needed to seek out other professional memberships to enhance your learning and your skills while you were working from home? So one of the things that I invested more heavily into um, in terms of memberships were professional storytelling organizations. I did more storytelling. I invested more in that because it's part of marketing and it's an important piece of work that I was not able to invest in prior to COVID. And would I let some professional memberships go? Absolutely. Not because I don't think they're valuable, but they are not providing value to me in my goals, in my effort moving forward. So what those professional networking opportunities will look like for you will be based on what do you see as valuable for you? What are, what are you hoping things move forward to? Or will you just change the, the channel a bit or, or tweak it to be something that you want to do, but not all of it? Look at that estimated time that you dedicated to these networks pre-COVID. Take a chance to see if it changed. Um, do you want to do more? Do you want to do less? Did you do more of it or did you do less of it? <clears throat> a lot of my professional networks, my professional career field networks, right? So you have several kinds of professional networks. I have the one uh, industry network for the organization that I work for. I have the <clears throat> connection uh, to the current job structure title that I have, which has its own network. And then I have my career field network. And then I have my volunteer field network. So my work network is the remodeling industry. My immediate job network is people who do office management, other office managers, you know, the roles and responsibilities of office managers. It required me to learn more accounting QuickBooks, which I didn't use very often. So then I tied myself back into the professional memberships of people who do office bookkeeping. Then you have the volunteer commitments more storytelling because that I missed and I want to do more of it. So I invested more time in it. Because the ones that I am letting go of, I did I miss them? Yes, I miss the people. I miss the social aspect. I miss seeing my colleagues, but it didn't provide value for the work that I'm doing right now. What is required of my current work from home and the current work that I do in office. So the organization that I work for did not shut down during COVID. They limited um, access to the building. We were on strict, you know, face mask requirements based on the state where it's um, where it's headquartered, all of those things. I had to do any of my networking online. You know, email, LinkedIn, did a lot of LinkedIn, um, but I didn't get to do any face-to-face -face meeting with my colleagues, people in our industry, other than the people who came into our office. And, um, you know, it really changed how I looked at that. But they're still so valuable right? 
networks are the single most important resource, in my opinion. And I think Bonnie Lo Craman of uh, Be the Ultimate Assistant talks about this a lot in her presentations. <clears throat> Bonnie talks about how resources, you know, uh, administrative professionals share our resources because we need to be able to reach out to one another for things we don't know how to do or don't know how to find or need immediate help with. And our professional memberships certainly enhance that resource network. But don't limit it to just your career field. Make sure you're covering areas outside of that because you don't know what you're going to need. Be strategic. That's what people love to use that word. Be strategic in that phrase about where you want to invest your personal time and value in your professional networking moving forward. Take some time. Think about it. Look at all the LinkedIn groups, Facebook groups that you belong to as a networker. Are, are you contributing? Are you providing value? Do you really need to get those emails, notifications? Do you need to take a break from them? Is this something you could snooze on Facebook for 30 days and come back and see if it's worth it? Something to think about, sure. So now comes the fun part, post-networking COVID. Post-COVID networking. I'm excited about the possibilities for this, but also nervous. So we're looking at a lot of people with hybrid organizations. We're looking at um, organizations that are requiring their work from home folks to come back into the office. And we're looking at conferences and seminars that are more hybrid than they ever were in the past. As I mentioned in, earlier in the presentation, uh, professional membership associations, which traditionally have an annual meeting, saw a spike in their conference attendance because they were online, which allowed greater flexibility. You know, so registration versus attendance. So there's a good point. So live registration, I don't know the number on that. But in terms of registration numbers and people intending on participating in a conference that was online and virtual rose while actual membership numbers of those organizations dropped. That was the tendency. And I have some, um, you know, I have the um, organization data to, to share that link with you where I got that from. But think about, you look at this gentleman in the left, you know, maybe he wants to continue to do his networking from home because it's more convenient for him. He gets to spend more time with his uh, child. Uh, perhaps his networking change. Maybe, I think I heard a lot of parents talk about how they spent more time getting to know their students' teachers during COVID than they ever did prior. I know in the States, it's really typical for parents to only get to meet the students' teachers maybe once or twice a year for evaluations, you know, for, for, for elementary and middle and high school. So you really don't get to, to know the faculty at, at your students' um, uh, educational level. You just don't. Uh, there's not time. I mean, I think we when our daughter was in high school or junior high, we must have spent like five minutes with each teacher for all her courses. And really, what can you get out of that? Nothing, really. There's no social aspect to it. But perhaps when you have an opportunity to do screen time and face-to-face -face time with uh, your students, your child's um, teachers, you could build that network a little bit stronger. And also people were building a network within their community, right? You heard about people creating bubbles and you got to know your neighbors and who they work for. And especially if they had like three or four kids all went to the same school and people would rotate who kept the kids so that somebody could do a meeting without interruption or, you know, do the lessons for Tuesday, Thursday, and then you would take Monday and another parent would take Wednesday. So all of those things would come to, come to happen and it built a community network or a 
bubble, as they were calling it, for educational purposes. But what will happen now that people are opening back up? Will that go away? I think some of it will definitely go away in terms of community work because people will return to their offices and their and their children will return to daycare. Um, but I think it will change their perspective as well and maybe break down some of those kind of um, more superficial interactions with our um, educational leaders and our neighbors. Just just a thought. This gentleman who is on the right, maybe for him, networking is all about just continuing to participate in events online. And because maybe that's what works for him in his schedule and it's more relaxing for him. Then you have the other gentleman who was like, no, I want to be in person and meet people and see people again. And to be fair, that's really a very personal choice. And you hope that it is um, more so, you know, without so many work restrictions, depending on your employment and your company. But, you know, younger, uh, newer to the workforce people, they're going to be a lot more comfortable with that shift back and forth. Whereas someone of my generation who lives for, um, you know, annual meetings and catching up with colleagues that I don't see but once a year and having that en masse group of people um, in person, there's just something I love about that. And so I would definitely love to be in that face-to-face -face group of post-COVID networking where you go out to dinner and you uh, maybe meet up for a walk before a session start, um, all those things. And then what, what will it be for value for people who want flexibility? And, and this is a big discussion uh, with retention issues and retention uh, written all the way through it. It's not just about work from home. It's about the flexibility to work within a much larger, more looser structure um, to, to accomplish the things that you wanna get done while you're accomplishing goals set by your company and certainly works with um, networking. If you have a colleague say like, I wanna talk to Lucy Brazier, I would love to network with her more often online, but her timing is such that I would have to get up at five o'clock in the morning to network with her unless she's ha hosting uh, an online networking session during an hour, which works for me. And that's tough. So, so say I went to my boss and said, you know, um, I'm going to take a course or catch up with my group of my colleagues early Monday morning. Can I work from home the rest of the day? Because really, ideally, if I have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and do like, I want to see everybody. I'm going to, I guarantee you, I'm going to have coffee. But if I'm going to be meeting with my colleagues, who are for that time zone, that's the requirement. I'm gonna want some time during the day where I could either catch 15 minute nap or allow myself to not be um, spot on because I'm tired and my, and my, um, my time clock is off. So looking at what post COVID networking will be, I, I think also one of the things that we'll see, what will happen with the holiday part? I can't wait to see how this unfolds. Now, a lot of the, not of the globe is not out of this by any means. And so like in Australia and South Africa right now, it's while I'm recording this, it's, it's already up the end of June, they're on lockdown. There's no socializing and networking um, unless it's online period. But in the States, you know, there's a lot more in-person, there's travel. Just getting to know people on airplanes and in airports and it's 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 different but i think there's still that wariness of you know in that also has a fatigue level to it as well 
So what will it look like for people moving forward? It's going to be based on where you live, where you work, and what you want, what provides value. Are the people that you are investing um, networking time in terms of building rapport, learning new things, investing in professional development, or attending um, workshops, conferences, and seminars, those things, where is that value for you? And in evaluating that, spending the time to look at, is it still worth it to me? Do I want to be a member with this? Do I need to join a different association? Do I need to stop um, pursuing this and pursue something else? Do I need to connect with a different group? Do I want to make sure that um, maybe a connection I made during work from home, do I still need that? Do I still want it? Do I still want to do that? Mm, think about it, evaluate it. Only you know what's going to work best for you. <clears throat> now, this is a great quote that came through while I was researching this topic of networking and conferences and such. Our inherent need for human connection doesn't mean that every introvert must become a social butterfly. Having human connection can look different for each person. And if you're not sure where to start in finding a meaningful connection, that's okay. And the Canadian Mental Health Association actually published this blog, The Importance of Human Connection, prior, prior to pandemic, pre-pandemic, which I th find quite fascinating. There was an option when pre-COVID, um, if you didn't want to join an association or a professional membership or participate in something at the office, to me, and I could be wrong, it felt like it was a lot easier to decline However, with everyone on the same screen and an, an increased emphasis on keeping the team together while we were working from home and online, <clears throat> it felt less voluntary and more obligatory. Um, and, and that's just, you know, my sense of it. I could be, I could be wrong. So this is who I am. Um, this is my website, coffeeencouraged.com. You can find me at coffeewithchem at gmail. I'm, I'm glad you joined me for this topic today. I know Peggy Vasquez, who's another speaker, did a recent um, presentation about the future of work and what it's going to look like for administrative professionals. But what will networking look like for professional admin professionals. What will our networking look like moving forward? Will we still see that generational um, splintering? Will we see a shift in where we invest our time and our energy? Will uh, there be a greater focus on um, investing in in-person opportunities because <clears throat> Um, of the difficulties of our career field at working remotely, or will it increase because now time zones may not matter and we can utilize that to see one another's smiling faces and ask questions whenever we, we want to set up a team meeting or a call. Only you're going to know what that's going to look like. Um, but it definitely has changed, right? The networking that we have done in the past um, doesn't just involve those happy hours and company holiday parties and uh, um, you know those, those socials pre-post conference. You're gonna see it as a more deliberate, I think, a more invested decision-making where I want to make sure my network connections and my rapport with only colleagues within my career field, but in my industry or in the industry that I'm interested in moving over to, right, those changes 
that's where it's going to be. Those changes are going to take place there for sure. And I'm thrilled that you were able to join me today. If you have any questions, you can email me at coffeewithchem at gmail.com. And you can check out my blog if you like. Or you can also catch me on Twitter at Coffee with Chem. Thanks for joining me today. I hope everybody stays healthy and happy.